Now that we've discussed various approaches to measuring utility functions and subjective probability measures, and we also discussed the binary lottery procedure as a way of inducing linear utility, this is a good time to discuss Rabin's calibration theorem. This result is not so much a method used in experimental economics, it is a criticism of expected utility in general, and it's highly influential in experimental economics as it informs the way in which good experiments can be designed. To summarise the result, it essentially says that when we're doing experiments using relatively small amounts of money, so amounts of money that are far less than a monthly income, for example, we really shouldn't expect to see any risk aversion if decision makers really are expected utility maximizers, Of course, we do see a lot of risk aversion even for very small gambles and this is a real problem for expected utility theory and points in the direction of behavioural economics as an alternative descriptive approach to economics. So let's look at Rabin's calibration theorem and see what it tells us about expected utility theory. So let's start by supposing that a risk-averse expected utility maximizer always rejects a small gamble of the following form. So win £11 or lose £10 on the basis of a coin toss. Now what do we mean when we say that a expected utility maximizer always rejects such a gamble? Well, we mean that whatever their wealth level is, so however much wealth they have, they reject this particular gamble. So that is the starting point of Rabin's analysis. And you can discuss whether you think it's reasonable. Um, I find it quite reasonable. Um, perhaps when wealth is incredibly large, it's less reasonable, although bounded versions of Rabin's argument do apply. So let's assume that this is the case. Now, formally, we can represent such preferences as follows. We could say that the lottery, which with 0.5 probability increases wealth by 11 and with 0.5 probability decreases wealth by 10, is worse, is less preferred to simply keeping one's wealth and we'll assume this is true for all wealth levels that are non-negative. Now, Rabin's calibration theorem takes this as a starting point, and roughly the theorem states that reasonable levels of risk aversion for small gambles, the kind of thing described above, necessarily lead to absurd levels of risk aversion once we look at larger gambles. To give you an insight of how this result is established, essentially Rabin shows that if for small gambles we see this type of risk aversion, it must be because marginal utility is changing very fast. So remember that under expected utility, you can only be risk averse because your von Neumann Morgenstern utility function is concave. So what Rabin shows essentially is that if it's concave enough in a small area to reject these small gambles, then as soon as we start looking at larger gambles, you get results which are completely absurd. So let's go on paper now and I'll show you how Rabin analysed this problem to get his celebrated result. OK, so let's analyse this preference condition a little more. So the starting point, which we think is fairly reasonable, is that the decision maker turns down all 50-50 gambles where they might win £11 or they might lose £10 with a 50-50 chance. So that's this lottery, a 0.5 chance of your wealth plus 11 or a 0.5 chance of your wealth minus 10. And we said this is considered worse than simply keeping your wealth, OK? I suppose I should write your wealth with probability 1, OK? And this is true for all uh, W non-negative. So what can we learn from this? Well, if I substitute expected utility, I get that the utility of W plus 11 uh, multiplied by 0.5 
plus 0.5 the utility of w minus 10 is less than the utility of w. Okay, so that's simply translating this preference statement into a statement about uh, this utility function u. So what can I say about this? Well, I know that um, halfway between this utility value and this utility value is less than this utility value. So another way of saying that is that the distance between this point and this point is less than the distance between this point and this point. Okay, so I'll just rearrange it uh, and get the utility of w plus 11 minus the utility of w. So that's the distance between this point and this point is less than the distance between this point and this point. Okay, it's less than halfway. So u of w minus utility of w minus 10. Okay, so to get from here to here, uh, you essentially just re you can just rearrange this. It's quite straightforward. And now I'm going to do something that will look unusual, but you'll see why I do it in a moment. I'm going to um, divide this side by 11. Okay, so I'm going to get u of w plus 11 minus u of w, and then divide this by 11. Okay. And this will be less than, I'll have to divide this by 11 as well. But I'm also going to multiply this side by 10 and divide it by 10. Whoops, that should be 11 on the bottom there. Um, so I've got 10 over 11, and then this distance, u of w minus u of w minus 10, divided by 10. Okay, so these uh, kind of marginal, we've got you can kind of see a relationship between marginal utility here. So we've got utility increasing uh, when I add 11 to wealth and dividing it by 11 is less than this 10 over 11 ratio of the same thing when I'm deducting 10 from utility. So let's go back on the slide and analyze this inequality a bit more to see where it gets us. So far, on paper, we've shown that if an expected utility maximizer rejects all 50-50 gambles where you can win £11 or lose £10, then the following inequality must hold for all non-negative levels of wealth. This is a relationship between differences in utility, which is essentially marginal utility. So let's see if we can be more precise about this. Well... The following inequality is necessarily true for all strictly increasing and concave functions f. So the derivative of f at a point y is less than this slope term f of y minus f of x divided by y minus x, which is also less than the derivative of f at x whenever x is less than y. So what does this mean? Well, Here's a graphical way. We won't prove this, but this diagram gives you the general idea. So here's a strictly increasing and concave function f. This green uh, tangent to the point y is the derivative of f evaluated at y. You can see it's quite flat. Slightly steeper than the derivative of f evaluated at y is this purple line, which has slope f of y minus f of x divided by y minus x. So rise over tread is the slope of this purple line. And steeper than the purple line and the green line is this tangent, the red line, which is the uh, derivative of f evaluated at x. So the inequality above is simply uh, captured in this picture. The green tangent is the flattest, this is uh, the purple line is steeper and the red tangent, the derivative of f at x, is steeper still. So that's how we get this inequality. So let's put this inequality to use. Recall we derived a particular inequality um, for differences in utility. So if we apply the above inequality twice, we get that the marginal utility at w plus 11 is less than 10 over 11 times the marginal utility of wealth minus 10. And this is true for all non-negative wealth levels.
So let's rewrite this a little. Essentially, we're talking about um, outcomes that are 21 units apart, 21 pounds apart. So we could rewrite the inequality as the marginal utility of x plus 21 is less than 10 over 11, the marginal utility at point x, and this holds for all non-negative x values. This is what we can derive as a consequence of assuming that our decision maker rejects all 50-50 gambles of win £11 versus lose £10. Now that we've established this inequality, this relationship between marginal utilities for amounts of money that are £21 apart, now comes the calibration. Consider uh, x plus 42. So that's £42 more than x. So it's £21 more twice. So we know that the marginal utility of x plus 42 is less than 10 over 11, the marginal utility of x plus 21, which is less than 10 over 11 multiplied by itself twice, which is 100 divided by 121, times the marginal utility at x. Now, if we keep doing this and consider larger differences, so for instance, what would the can, what can we say about the marginal utility at x plus 420? Of course, 420 is 21 times by 20. So we know that the marginal utility at x plus 420 is less than 10 over 11 to the power 20 times the marginal utility of x. So what does this mean? This means increasing the, um, the amount of money by 420 decreases marginal utility by at least 85%. So 10 over 11 to the power 20 is about um, 0.15, so a decrease of 85%. Let's keep going. If we add 840 to x, so this is um, 21 times 40, well then we know that an uh, the marginal utility of x plus 840 must be less than 10 over 11 to the power 40 times the marginal utility of x. And so an £840 increase in the outcomes we're dealing with means marginal utility, the extra utility you get from that money, has decreased by at least 98%. 10 over 11 to the power 40 is about 0.02. So what does this mean in practical terms? Well, it means that marginal utility, the additional benefit the decision maker gets from increasing money, is decreasing rapidly. So as the amounts of money get larger and larger, the effect of having those extra gains is becoming increasingly small. Similarly, if the losses become larger and larger, the effect is magnified by this. So marginal utility will grow incredibly quickly as the amounts are reduced. And so using inequalities like these, Rabin gave many examples. So here is a table of some of the consequences of this rapid change in marginal utility that is implied by risk aversion for very small gambles. So we've called this the implausible consequences of risk aversion for small gambles under expected utility. So suppose an expected utility maximizer always turns down a 50-50 bet where they lose £10 or gain £11. That was the example we started with. Well, if we increase the loss side of this to £100, of course, that has a huge effect on the decision maker's marginal utility. In fact, the effect is so large that there is no gain that can ever counteract this. And so even if the gain is increased up to, well, infinity, so a pr which just means a direction, so increase the gain as high and high as you want, you will never find a gamble that this decision maker will accept if they are going to lose £100 with 50% chance. And of course, this is ridiculous. If you had a 50-50 gamble where you might lose £100 or you might gain £1 trillion, you would be insane to turn such a gamble down. 
To illustrate the same point, many other examples were cooked up. So, for example, a, a, an expected utility maximizer who always turns down a fair bet, lose £100 versus gain £110, they will turn down every bet, conceivable bet, where they are going to lose £1,000 with a 50% chance. So even if the gain is uh, infinite, it's simply not enough. There is no gain large enough to make them uh, accept a gamble with a 50% chance of losing £1,000. So again, this is completely implausible. And one more example, a decision maker who always turns down a, a lose £1,000 versus gain £1,000 uh, 50 50 lottery. So, if they turn down that lottery for all wealth levels, then a gamble where they would lose £10,000 with a 50% chance, there is no gain that will ever make them accept it, no matter how large, no matter how many trillions of pounds we put on the gain side of that gamble, it will simply never be enough because the additional utility from increasing that gain, the marginal utility, is just so small. So that is Rabin's famous calibration theorem, a very strong criticism of expected utility theory, um, essentially because it says if we see risk aversion for small gambles, it can't be because the uh, decision makers in our experiments are really expected utility maximizers. If they were expected utility maximizers, such behavior for small gambles would lead to absurd behavior for large gambles. And so if we see risk aversion in experiments for small gambles, it's probably not because of utility curvature, it's probably because of something else. Many critics have said that this is due to something called asset integration. So when expected utility maximizers look at the payoffs in these gambles, they are looking at the utility of the payoff plus their wealth. So they're integrating the gain into whatever wealth level they have when they evaluate this lottery. A different theory in behavioral economics called prospect theory ignores wealth essentially and looks at changes from a reference point. So gains and losses are evaluated simply as gains and losses. And this is one way of resolving Rabin's paradox. So this is an advantage over a behavioral model such as prospect theory for descriptive purposes over expected utility theory. Rabin also used his calibration theorem to criticize experimental methods, in particular the binary lottery procedure. Now remember, we looked at the binary lottery procedure as a way of inducing linear utility, so paying in probability points in order to induce linear utility. Now this only works if the, the decision makers in our experiment, our experimental subjects, are really expected utility maximizers. Okay, so if they're not expected utility maximizers, the procedure is completely inappropriate. Rabin also noted, however, that if they are expected utility maximizers, then the theory itself suggests that for small gambles, they should be risk neutral. And so the method, while appropriate for expected utility maximizers, is essentially unnecessary. So it's inappropriate for non-expected utility maximizers, but simply unnecessary for expected utility maximizers. And this is quite a strong criticism. I include Rabin's result at the end of this course to stimulate your interest in looking into issues uh, that are very well known in behavioral economics. I believe there's a module in behavioral economics next semester, and it's a very rich area uh, for research ideas and so on, and having a strong theoretical background in microeconomics will serve you well. So I'll leave you with that, and in the meantime, take care.